as I said earlier, I am giving you today the answer to all of life's problems. This will solve every problem in the world. Unfortunately, most people will never embrace it, will never believe it. And therefore, the problems will not only continue, they will, in fact, get worse, according to Scripture. Now, I want you to think about that today. And I'm going to be very uh, straightforward with uh, where we find ourselves in our study in Romans, because it, it is that way, all right? What happens when we turn our backs on God? That's the question today. What happens when we turn our backs on God's? Well, we should learn from history because history often repeats itself. Our world and even our nation is unraveling before our eyes. The social atmosphere that we have in these United States of America is one that is toxic, all right? I can't even watch the news. I, I just can't take it anymore. Um, uh, it's, it's one thing after another after another. Uh, I can remember it wasn't that many years ago when, when uh, there was at least a little bit of class in Washington and in politics where when they wanted to say that somebody who had an opposing position was or, or wasn't being honest, they would say, they wouldn't say they're a liar or they're a cheat or they're a, a, a rat or they're a expletive. They would say, at least at a little class, they would say they're disingenuous. That means they're a liar. <laughs> but at least it had a little class, right? It's not where we find ourselves today, though. Now, Paul wrote this letter of Romans around A.D. 57 under Roman rule, and yet the pattern is still true for all societies today. God has his truth. You reject the truth. You pay the price for that. Nothing has changed. Everything's the same as it was back then. The issues are the same. The answers are the same, okay? So we're going to look at several different issues today. We're going to be looking at, um, we're looking at uh, four different issues, and we'll go through those in order. The first one is this. We're going to start with the solution, all right? And we've already seen it over the last two weeks, and this is number one today, God's loving solution to man's need. God's loving solution to man's need. God loves mankind. God has, has been, has always reached out. As soon as Adam and Eve fell and sinned in the Garden of Eden, God immediately gave them the solution and the promise about the solution. And all he asked them to do is trust in this promised seed who would come as the Savior, as the solution. And uh, I believe they did, all right? But that doesn't mean that people after that didn't have to do the same. And that's where the breakdown has come in. We see God's loving solution to man's need in verses 16 and 17. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein... In the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. In other words, it begins with faith, and all the way through the end, it's through faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. This is the good news of Christ, the gospel, the gospel message. What is the gospel message? That Christ died for our sins, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. He died for our sins. He was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And when you put your faith, your trust in him, that the payment he made is good on your behalf. In other words, you're trusting in him that his payment for your sins is enough to get you to heaven, not part of the solution, the total solution. He gives you that moment, everlasting life. He gives you salvation, all right? He gives you eternal life. This is the good news of Christ. This is how man can become free from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and one day the very presence of sin. This is the ultimate and the eternal solution to all of man's problems. We are born into the world as sinners. 
We have a corrupt nature. That is why we do things wrong. That's why we are selfish. That's why we are mean to people. That's why people kill each other and hurt each other. That's why homes break up. That's why there is abuse of every form. That is why people are selfish. That is why people are arrogant. That is why there are crooks in this world, okay? That's why people kill other people simply because they want their own way. And the solution to all of that is salvation through Jesus Christ. You're not going to change the old nature. We need a new nature. And when you trust Jesus Christ as Savior, he gives you a new nature which is literally born of him, and it is perfect in its character and in its way. And then he tells those of us who have trusted Christ the Savior, who have that new nature, I now want you to walk in the newness of life that you have. I want you to walk now according to that new nature. And he said this, walk in the Spirit, and guess what? You won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh, the old sinful nature that you have. The, once you trust Christ, the capacity to do those wicked, heinous things is still there. But you don't have to do it, <laughs> okay? I thought it was a familiar voice I was hearing back then. <laughs> this is the good news. But man is in rebellion. And so what happens when man says, that's all fine and good, but that's religious hocus-pocus stuff. I don't buy into that kind of stuff. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to come up with my own solutions. Well, that leads us to number two, man's rejection of God's solution. Verses 18 through 23. You see, the world is guilty, the world is condemned, and it is disintegrating. Now, when I talk about the world, I'm not talking about the environment. God is the one in control of that. You can relax. We are not going to, uh, we are not going to be wiped off the face of the earth through climate change, global warming, whatever you want to call it. God controls the environment. He will do it, okay? And yes, one day he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. That's a long time away, folks. That's a long time away. Don't worry about it. The most important thing is that you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Much of the world, though, doesn't want any part of God's good news and is even hostile towards that. And we wonder why things keep falling apart. This is what happens when we turn our backs on God. As wonderful as salvation by grace is, most people will not receive it. Now, we have an obligation to get it to them. We had 125 ladies in here yesterday to our, our, our uh, fall tea and luncheon. 125 ladies. It was a wonderful turnout. And you know, I had the great privilege of presenting the gospel to the ladies who are here. Uh, I, I brought them to a decision. We didn't do any kind of a hand raise or anything, but I, I did try. I just please trust Jesus. I pleaded, would you please trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? He wants you to be his child. He wants you to go to heaven. He doesn't want you to go to hell. I don't know how many trusted Christ. I hope some did. I don't know how many. I know our church ladies are already saved, and that's wonderful. But I hope some got saved. I really do. But here's the point, folks. Most people are not going to receive it. A rejection of God's truth brings us to the last part here of chapter 1. This is what happens when we reject the truth of God personally and nationally and globally, all right? But it also shows us the root of our problem, and this leads to what we see in verse 18. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of God, the anger of God, okay? Now, I know there's some little uh, people running around the world. I don't, I don't believe in a, in a God of wrath. I don't believe in a God of wrath, you know. I don't think God has a right to be angry with man. And I thought God's supposed to be loving all the time and all this kind of stuff, okay? Friend, those kind of statements just simply shows the ignorance 
that is there. You do not understand God. Let me say this. God made us. We didn't make ourselves. And if he made us, he has a right to be angry with something that is contrary to his will for us. See, here's the thing. Sin kills. Okay? The wages of sin is death. Not only eternal separation from God, but it will ruin our lives. And God doesn't want that. And God knows the potential of that and what it can do. And he gets angry when he sees this. That doesn't mean he doesn't love. That doesn't mean he's not gracious and merciful. But that has to do with accepting his solution to those things before we get the benefits. The wrath of God. God is not happy with the path man has taken. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he's angry about it. And he has a right to be. He made us. He made us. And you notice it says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, when the Bible talks about, our, our Bible, our King James here, when it talks about hold, it doesn't mean you just, you know, it's like a Bible, you just have it in your hand. No, that's not the idea here. The idea here, this word hold, means to hold down or suppress it, okay? To hold down or suppress it. They, in other words, they know the truth is there, but they are trying to hold it down and keep it out of view. That's what they're trying to do. So much for freedom of speech, by the way. Now, we are seeing this more and more in our nation, and we are seeing the high technology companies such as Facebook and Google and so forth. These are the Apple also, by the way. These are the people who say freedom of speech, freedom of speech. But really what they mean, if you look at the fine print, if I could call it that, is freedom of speech for everyone but Christians. They're holding down the truth. Okay? Because, see, folks, when you have a world in rebellion and you don't like the truth about why you have rebellion and the problems you have, you're going to try to hold that down so no one hears it and suppress it. So much for freedom of speech. You look at the secular and even, and even Christian universities today, by the way, not just the secular ones. We don't expect anything good from St. Cloud State University. And I hope no one's thinking, why not? It's not going to happen. Okay? Now, I hope that, uh, I know, Brian, you've talked to the president over there, and, and I hope that uh, there's a, a change of mind over there, and there is true freedom of speech, but it's not. It's really not there on campus the way it should be. But you know, folks, when you've got Christian universities that are saying Basically, the Bible, you can't take it literally. Uh, the six-day creation is not true. I mean, it goes on and on and on. They're accepting all kinds of alternative lifestyles and all these different things now. What are you doing by that? You are rejecting the truth that, by the way, your college was built on. You're rejecting the truth of that, and by rejecting it, you're holding it you're holding it down. Because when you start taking a position of we are against this, we don't believe this anymore, you're saying that's not welcome here. And you're holding it down. The science community in evolution versus creation, we see that so very clearly. All right? Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 19. It says, because that, here you go, here's the history. Because that when... Uh, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Now, verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I won't do it, but I could spend a week talking about this verse. The Lord has left a constant witness to the world of his reality and his truth. It is a constant witness. When I say that, folks, I'm talking about 24-7. There are two 
major witnesses in this world that are going on 24-7. Actually, there's several more, but we're going to look at two of them this morning. The first one is this, the issue of creation. Creation. Notice in verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. What does that mean? Here's what people say today, okay? Well, I don't believe in God because I can't see him. Hey, you can't see him because he's a spirit. When you die, you will see him. Here's the issue, though, friend. You may not be able to see him, but the evidence of him is everywhere. It is everywhere, and it is in the world in which we live, the magnificence of the creation that we have, all right, is clearly, clearly seen. The design, the geometry, the balance of environment, the miracle of reproduction, all of these things are amazing, and they are the handiwork of God. The heavens declare, the heavens, space, the heavens declare the glory of God. Declare, you know what that means? A witness. God is speaking. I am real. I am here. I am bigger than you. I'm the boss. Okay? I'm the boss. The invisible things of him. Look at Psalm 19, 1. Hold your place in here in Romans 1. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly uh, seen. Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech. Isn't that interesting? Day unto day uttereth speech. They're witnessing. And night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Did you catch that in verse 3? Doesn't matter what language, doesn't matter what country, doesn't matter where you live, God is speaking through creation. And if you will accept the light of creation, he will give you more light. Okay? And this is going on 24-7 all over the world. Here's the truth of it. Outside of the lie that you can work your way to heaven... There is perhaps no lie that has had more far-reaching effects on the world than Darwin's theory of evolution. Well, we call it Darwin's. It was before that. But still, the idea of evolution that is so prevalent, it is everywhere. Isn't it everywhere? Evolution is a frontal attack on the Word of God and on God himself. Okay? Things, now, now, just think about this for a minute. Everything came from nothing. Think about that. That's what they're teaching. Everything came from nothing. That is, a, that is a, an insult to human thinking. It is an insult. What do I mean by that? I don't use this word often, but I have to. How stupid do you think we are? <laughs> that really is it. How stupid do you think we are? If you don't have anything, you don't have anything to do anything. How can everything come from nothing? Nothing has no characteristics. But we're supposed to believe that. If you don't believe that, you're not intelligent. No, friend, here's the truth of it. I want you to just let, we just need to think about this. If you believe that, you show a lack of reasoning. But here's the truth. People have bought into it. Why? Because God is speaking and the Lord is convicting and people don't like what they're hearing and what they're feeling about that. And so they've got to come up with some solution outside of what the Bible says and the God of the Bible. And so then they come up with these things. And don't you think it's interesting, the rise of of Darwin's evolutionary ideas, okay, um, all of that, all of that, the origin of the species, his book, and all of that, it all gained traction at the same time that liberalism gained traction back in the uh, mid-1800s. 
liberalism came in and basically the, all, all the stuff of higher textual criticism, okay? Uh, now, I know textual criticism isn't necessarily, the word criticism doesn't necessarily in itself have a negative connotation, but in the world in which we live today, it fits perfectly. This is a perfect book. Why are you criticizing it? Just believe it. Just believe it. Well, we're arguing over what is and what isn't the Word of God. Why? It, it, it is. Anyways, and so that's your opinion. I get that. But it's not an ignorant opinion. Okay? It's one that's born out of many years of studying this issue. Evolution is a frontal attack on the Word of God and God Himself. Creation is screaming. Creation is saying, there is a God. Look around you. The evidence of him being here is all over the place. Go to uh, 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 Clemens Gardens. Go look at the flowers that are there. Look at the geometry. You know what I, what I mean by that? The geometry, the design that is there. Folks, they're not just... <laughs> <laughs> There's bing, 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 bing. Beautiful geometry in the flowers and in the plants and the way things are. I mean, it is just absolutely awesome. Absolutely awesome. All evidence of a creator. The human body, it is a miracle. The eye, the human eye is an absolute miracle. I mean, I'm not, listen, I could go on and on. We don't have time, but I want you to just be thinking about that. It doesn't just happen. So the, left, the Lord has left us with a constant witness uh, to his world and his reality and truth. One, we see creation, all right? But let's go back to uh, Romans 1.21. See, you might say, well, I, I just don't, I don't believe God created it. Well, see, God is very bold in his statements. You can be bold when you're right. If you're bold and you're not right, you're a fool. But if you're right and you're bold, nothing wrong with that. Well, God is bold in his statements. As a matter of fact, he addresses that very issue in Psalm 14.1 where it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And he says, they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So if you don't believe God exists, the one doesn't exist are a fool. You're a fool. Romans chapter 1. See, here's where we find ourselves. And you might say, well, how do people get to where? How did we get to where we are today? Romans 1.21. Because that when they knew not God, they glorified him not as God. There was a time when man knew God, but he didn't glorify him as God. Neither were thankful but instead they became vain in their imaginations. The word vain means empty. And their foolish heart was what? Darkened, darkened. Darkened from what? From the light that God has given. Professing themselves to be wise, they became what? Fools. The Greek word, moranos. We get our word moron from this. And what did they do? Look at verse 23. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and to creeping things. Sounds like an evolutionary chart, doesn't it? God told us all about it in A.D. 57 when Paul penned these words. The Lord said, this is, this is the pattern. This is the pattern of history. It will always be this way. This is the digression of societies. When they reject me, this is what happens. That's why things get the way they are. Here it is. The other witness, by the way, is the Word of God itself. Turn with me to John chapter 20. 
John chapter 20. I could give you many scriptures on this issue of the word being the witness. But you know, as I was uh, uh, studying this week and preparing, I said, Lord, boy, I'm so glad God is real. I said, Lord, can you give me a, a passage I've never applied to this point before? And he said, not in an audible voice, but in the answer to my prayer, immediately, son, why don't you go over to John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Ah, thank you, Lord. Look at this. Remember, God is witnessing to his reality, to the need of salvation, because that is the solution to mankind. And then here we have it in John 20, 30. And many other signs. At the end of the gospel of John, this big gospel, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written. John, under inspiration of the Spirit, says, the things that are written in this book, here's why they're written. Here you go. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The scriptures are here so that we will believe and we will be saved. That's why they're here. And by the way, don't you think it's interesting that the Gospel of John begins with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. The Word of God is a constant witness. That's why we need to not only be in it, we need to be sharing it with people. By the way, if you are listening today or watching or going to listen to recordings down the way, uh, those things are there for the express purpose of you, dear friend, that you would trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. We want you to go to heaven when you die. We don't want you to go to hell when you die. And you can have the assurance of salvation this moment if you'll trust Christ as Savior. That's why we do media ministry, is so others may know. So what do we see so far? We see, one, God's loving solution to man's need. Secondly, we see man's rejection of God's loving solution. Third, we see the results of man's rejection. Here you go, the slippery slope. Verse 24, wherefore, okay, man rejected God's ways, continues to reject God's ways. Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up. Now I want you to understand, don't read that and say, oh, God gave up on man. It's not what it says. God did not give up on man. God has not given up on man. God is not going to give up on man. But once you die, there's nothing more he can do. But here's what it's saying. Man was so rebellious, so stubborn, so wicked, and demanded his own way. God says, okay, go ahead and have it. That's what it means. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. And that means moral uncleanness. It doesn't mean you've got dirty hands from the garden. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. You see where the origin of it is? To dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Sexual perversion. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. What is that? Serving the creature more than the creator. It's humanism. It's humanism. This is why we are in the mess we are in today. This is a perfect picture of secular humanism. It is a man-centered system. Man is God. What about God? No, no place for him. Hold that down. Get rid of that out of society. No place for him. 
Everything revolves around what man wants to do and what he thinks is right according to his own appetites of the hour. We wonder why we have the problems we do today. It is because we have rejected God and his word. Let me say it again. You, we have the problems we have today because we have rejected God and we have rejected his word. Okay? Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Even when I was a child, and there were problems when I was a child in this world, no, no doubt about that, but friends, listen, right was still right. Not everybody wanted it, but right was still right. Right meaning what? The word of God, the morals, the principles of Scripture. What this nation was founded on, listen, this nation was founded on this book. Okay? And the ethics of our nation... They were not perfect people. They were sinners. Yes, they were. But the ethics of this nation were founded on this book. We call it a Judeo-Christian ethics. Okay, now listen, what does that mean? It simply means the ethics of the Bible. That's what it means. What was given to the Jews and what was given to the Christians of today. But see, where are we today? People call evil good and good evil. Those things that are dark, they say, oh, those are good. Those things that are good, they say, oh, those things are dark. Those are bad. Okay? Romans 1.26, for this cause God gave them up. Look at that. Verse 24, God also gave them up. Verse 26, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman. And that's not talking about abuse. That's talking about uh, uh, the way it's supposed to be, human reproduction, the way God intended it to be, okay? Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, unfitting, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their heir which was meat or fitting. Now, listen. This speaks of homosexuality, and that is contrary to the Word of God. All right? <clears throat> doesn't mean God doesn't love homosexuals. God loves them as much as he loves anybody else, but the solution to our sin has never changed. It is understanding we are sinners, we need a Savior, and Jesus Christ is that Savior, and he is the answer. Homosexuality is sin. It is an abomination to God, as many sins are, including pride, by the way, including gossip, by the way. God created us male and female, and the human race continues only as we honor that union. And by the way, it is within the bounds of marriage, not living together. That is called fornication in the Bible. This is not, that's hate speech, that's hate, no, no, listen, no, friend, it's not hate speech, it's common sense. It's common sense. Yet we've got this absolute foolishness today because we've rejected the standards of God to where we are teaching little children, preschool age, kindergarten age, it's happening in the schools. We're teaching them. Well, we don't know what you are. Male or female. I will be discreet. Okay? Just exam examine your abdomen. You can figure it out. It takes about one second. Okay? God made you a certain way down there, and friend, that is it. That tells you what you are. You don't have to be confused about it. You might say, well, I got this feeling, I've got that feeling. The feelings are another matter. God has answers of that, okay? But what you are is locked in. 
The Bible says in Leviticus 18, 22, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination, and it is. But this is one of the fruits of the rejection of the God of the Bible. But it doesn't stop there. As society continues to fall apart, other sins are also manifested. Verse 28, it says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Do you see it? Starts with people holding down the truth, and then it's like, well, we don't want to retain God in our knowledge. Get God out of the public schools. Get prayer out of the public schools. Get God out of society. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over, there it is again, to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. When a person is enslaved by sin and their conscience is convicted, they want to get rid of the Word of God. Why? Because it convicts them. It makes them know, listen, this is wrong. What I'm doing is wrong. This is sinful. Well, how do I get rid of that? Get rid of God in the Bible. By the way, you'll never do that. An immoral society or individual is going to want to do away with biblical creation, or biblical creation, or excuse me, biblical Christianity because it is a conviction to them. Now, you notice God gives them over to a reprobate mind. What does that mean? The word reprobate means disapprove or rejected. And in the context, it is a disapproved by God or rejected by God mind. God rejects the thinking. God rejects that, those ideas. It is a mind that God rejects and disapproves of. But God gives them over to it because that's what they want. Now, when here's what happens. When that void comes, then it will be filled with all kinds of perversion and corruption. What is the result of this? Verses 29 through 31. Look at this, folks. Being filled with all unrighteousness, unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, Debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, okay? The word fornication is the Greek word pornea. We get our word pornography from it. It is a multi-billion dollar industry today in our nation, and we are pumping this stuff worldwide. And it is demonic, and it is destructive. And why do we have the problems with it? It's because people have rejected the God who said, no, this is the way your sexual life is supposed to be. We find the guidelines for it in the Word of God. People don't want it. Verse 30, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. It, completely out of control. That's what it's talking about. People who are so under the control and domination of their flesh and that which is wicked... This is where we find ourselves today. Why? Because we have first and foremost rejected God's solution. It seems like the world is about to explode, doesn't it? The description here in Romans 1 is a world that very few people would really like to live in. Yet it is what you get when you turn your back on God and his word. I believe that our nation is moving towards a civil war. I really do believe that. I believe we're moving towards a civil war between biblical, traditional American values and an immoral, perverse, socialistic globalism. That is the battle right now, by the way, in America, those two ideas. That is the battle. 
See, everything was, was kind of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say quiet, but we knew the, the, the fight was there and all that. And, and regardless of whether, what you think of our president, I will tell you one thing that he's done. Well, there's, there's several. Now, again, I'm not a fan of the way he is. I am not a fan, okay, as far as the way he handles himself and some of the things he says. But here is one thing he's done, friends. He has emboldened those with traditional Christian values in our nation, okay? He's emboldened them, and people are standing up more, I believe, than they ever have before. And with that comes now a war between those who are taking us towards a socialistic globalism. And now you've got people saying, no, wait a minute, you're not going to do that. Hold it right there. You're not going to do that. And we've got a huge fight on our hands. And it's going towards a civil war. Proverbs 14, 34, still in the Bible, it says this, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach unto any people. Yes, it's where we're at. We have a choice, don't we? So let's close with this, number four, the answer to man's rebellion. Okay? We trace our steps. What did we start with? God's loving solution to man's need. Secondly, we saw man's rejection of God's solution. Third, We've seen the result of man's rejection. And fourth, the answer to man's rebellion and rejection. And it is this. <laughs> well, it is once again God's loving solution to man's need. Full circle. Bing. Start here. Down it goes. A mess, a mess, a mess. Unraveling. Disaster, 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 disaster. What are we going to do? Bing right where you started. That's what you're going to do. It's what we need to do. It can only be found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word. It is your choice whether you're going to embrace that or not. The results are clearly spelled out in Romans 1. We either do it God's way or we suffer the consequences of doing it our own way. So number one, friend, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to trust in Him as your Savior today. He went to the cross to pay for all of your sin. Look up here. Here we are as sinners. Okay? You can't get to heaven with even one sin. It's a perfect place. And God says our sin's got to be paid for. Because there's nothing we could do of ourselves to pay for that sin, He took on flesh the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself, and he went to the cross because he loves us so much. He went to the cross and that sin that he absolutely abhors, he took it and embraced it and paid for it. The wrath of the Father was poured out on him, his own son, because he loves us so much. Jesus did it. He died, he came back from the dead, and the Bible says if you'll trust in Jesus Christ, that he made that payment for you, he'll give you everlasting life. All your sin, past, present, future, forgiven. Forgiven. If you'll trust in Christ. He's the only solution. You might say, well, I'm already saved. Amen. Amen. Then what should we do? Well, we need to live according to the word of God. Okay? John 8, 32, Jesus put it this way. He said, you shall know the truth. The truth will make you free. 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 How? By knowing the truth. That begins with knowing him. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Trust in Christ. Put your faith in him today. Look at it over here. For by grace are you saved through faith, faith in Christ, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Our good works won't save us. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Solution, Jesus Christ and the Word of God. That's it. That's it. Well, I don't believe that. I don't like it. Well, friend, you suffer the consequences. You, you don't want to live in a world that's getting worse and worse and worse. No one does. But it's not going to get better until you accept the solution. And there's only one. Let's pray. 
With heads bowed and eyes closed today, please, no one looking around. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you do that today? Would you do that today? God loves you. He sent his son to pay for your sin. He did that. If you'll trust in him, the payment he made will be put to your account. It'll be like your payment for your own sin. But he did it for you. You can't do it by good works. You could never be good enough. But Jesus did it for you. He made the complete payment for all your sin. And he's offering you eternal life as a gift. Would you trust in him today as your Savior? Right where you sit, the quietness of your mind. You can't make a mistake. God is reading your mind. He knows your thoughts. Friend, would you trust Christ if you've never done it? Or would you trust in him? Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and I understand today I can't save myself. I am trusting in Jesus Christ right now to save me, to give me eternal life. Friend, he knows your heart. If you'll trust him, he'll save you. If today, if you finally understood it today, you've never understood it until today, but today you trusted Christ, could I pray for you? Just slip up your hand, put it down. I won't embarrass you in any way, but it just lets me know that you, you got it today. You understood it. You trusted Christ. Raising your hand doesn't save you. It just lets me know that it made sense to you. Is there anyone? Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've given us. We grieve, Father, at this deceived, fallen world in which we live. Help us, Father, stand on your truth in love and kindness, not mean-spirited, but boldly, knowing this is the truth. Jesus Christ, the living word, the Bible, the living written word. This is the truth, and therein we stand. Thank you for this day, Father. Give us a great afternoon, and also, Father, bring us back tonight as we observe the Lord's Supper that we reflect some more on what Jesus has done for us, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening, and would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.